So, uh, anyone tired of winter yet, just by any chance? Maybe a little bit. I think it was Shakespeare a couple hundred years ago who wrote, now is the winter of our discontent. Well, this has been the winter of our discontent. Actually, it's not even winter anymore. You know what it's called now? Polar vortex. We've been stuck for months up until this past week in a polar vortex. No matter what you call it, I'm just getting a little bit tired. A couple of weeks ago on a Monday, it snowed most of the day like seven inches of fresh new snow, and I happened, happened to be out all afternoon and all evening, so I couldn't get up the driveway to shovel it until late that night. So I took one of my sons out with me about 10 o'clock at night, took about 30 minutes to shovel our whole driveway to get it clear because I didn't want to have to do it in the morning. Got up Tuesday morning, very proud of myself for having shoveled the night before as I headed out to my weekly 7 a.m. Tuesday morning meeting. Backed my car out and got to the end of my driveway and crunched right into what felt like a wall of snow. Jumped out of my car, I'm stuck in my driveway, half in, half out, and I noticed that evidently the night before, after we had shoveled, the snow tr plow trucks had come by, plowed the street, and piled a bunch of snow right up against the end of my driveway. That ever happened to you? Well, it happened that day. Parked my car, got out, went and got the shovel, went out and hacked my th way through 18 inches of snow and ice just to get my car out of the driveway that I had already shoveled the night before. One of my boys saw me shoveling and said, Dad, you're shoveling angry. I said, yep. I suppose I could have been grateful to live in a town affluent enough to have people out there plowing in the middle of the night so the roads could be safe in the morning. I could have been grateful for that, but I really wasn't. I was actually profoundly ungrateful in that moment. Now, so today we're in the fourth part of a series called You Were Made for This. We're talking about growing in worship. All year long, we've been talking about growth, how God wants us to grow in all areas of our spiritual lives. And we're talking about worship in particular. And throughout the series, we've used two definitions of worship. Let me remind you of them today. First, worship is offering extravagant devotion to someone or something. Offering extravagant devotion. Now, by that definition, we can actually offer that kind of devotion to all kinds of things, even things and activities that are not God, because we're built to worship something. The second definition becomes a little clearer for us as followers of Christ. That is, worship is responding to all God is with all that we are. And that's what this series is about. So far, in the series from Psalms, we've covered worship as acknowledging God for who He is, sovereign, holy, creator, shepherd. Uh, worship as confession. When we come before a holy God, we confess ourselves and our sinfulness, our need for forgiveness. Worship as offering ourselves to God. And throughout the series, we've been encouraging you to share your own experiences of worship, your own inspirational thoughts or images or, or, or ideas or prayers through the social media like Facebook or Twitter or Instagram using the hashtag, you were made for this. We've been seeing all kinds of fun things posted on their FBCG Facebook page. You might want to go to that page and check it out. Images and pictures and blogs and thoughts that people have. Because your thoughts about worship might encourage somebody else. So take advantage of that and go check it out. Today we look at worship as thanksgiving. And we're reading from Psalm 111 today. So we're going to put these verses on the screen. I'm going to read them for you. I'm reading today out of the English Standard Version. The psalmist writes, Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered, for the Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works, giving them the inheritance of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. Now, the first thing I think we take of this beautiful psalm is that giving thanks is worship. Giving thanks in and of itself is worship. Now, when I say the word thanksgiving... 
my mind most easily goes to the holiday that we call Thanksgiving. You know, turkey and dressing and pumpkin pie and pilgrims and mayflowers and all that. Spending a day with family and friends, maybe watching a little football, and that's all good. Most of us love Thanksgiving time. But the psalm here is reminding us that Thanksgiving, the giving of thanks to God, is much, much more than a holiday. It's first and foremost an act of worship in and of itself. The psalm begins, praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Now, throughout the series, we've uh, been saying that while the Bible does talk about elements of worship, uh, things like music and instruments and sanctuaries, uh, that's not the main point of worship. Because worship is not something we observe other people do. It's something we do ourselves. And so it's quite clear that God is most interested in the condition and posture of our hearts as we worship Him. In fact, all the elements of worship that we do up here, here at West Campus, are meaningless if our hearts are not engaged in worship. So today we're focused on the attitude of the heart called thanksgiving. Over and over again throughout the Psalms, we see expressions of thanksgiving in the context of both personal and community worship. For example, Psalm 116 says, I will sacrifice a thank offering to you. We'll talk about thank offerings in just a minute. And call on the name of the Lord. Here you see that thanksgiving is offered simply in response to who God is. Sovereign, holy, good. We call on His name with thanksgiving. It's the beginning of worship. And then we see in Psalm 107, let them give thanks to the Lord for His unfailing love and His wonderful deeds for men. Let them sacrifice thank offerings and tell of His works with songs of joy. Now this time, thanksgiving is offered to God for the things He has done, for the things He has given, for His wonderful deeds, His works of love. And that's what we usually think about when we think of thanksgiving, being thankful for material blessings. In Psalm 50, verse 23, it's actually God speaking through the psalm writer. He says, He who sacrifices thank offerings honors me, and he prepares the way that I may show him the salvation of God. Now here, thanksgiving seems to be in a spiritual sense. It seems to be connected to the very salvation of God. Now, in all three of these examples, and I could have pointed to many more, we see the phrase, sacrifice, thank, offerings. What's the ancient writer talking about? What does it mean to sacrifice, thank, offerings? Well, you have to look further back into the history of the Old Testament, all the way back to the book of Leviticus, which very few of us ever read. It's full of complicated religious laws and a sort of a weird ancient world. But when we go back that far, we see that God required his people to offer all kinds of different sacrifices, and it was in response to his holiness. The entire Old Testament is about God establishing his holiness and authority among his people. One of those sacrifices was called the peace offering or the thank offering. In Hebrew, it was called the toda sacrifice. It, it, it involved bringing different kinds of bread uh, baked and brought to the Lord as a sacrifice, followed by sacrificing an animal that was then roasted and eaten as a feast by the people entirely in one day. So the thank offering was understood as being a sacrifice offered because we've, you, the person, people had been saved from death. They had received new life. In Leviticus 7, we see that that sacrifice of thanks offered was after the guilt sacrifice, which was really confession of sin. So you put all that together, and I'm kind of rushing through that, to see that the sacrifice of thanksgiving was for having one's sins forgiven, one's sins atoned for, and therefore receiving new life. So we put those two things together and we see that, first of all, the giving of thanks is an act of worship in and of itself, and therefore there cannot be any genuine worship of God without the giving of thanks. And secondly, we see that thanksgiving is about more than being grateful for our many material blessings. It is about that. We'll talk about that in a moment. But it's also responding to God's spiritual blessings, to forgiveness from sin, to salvation. Psalm 103 summarizes both of these beautifully. It says, Praise the Lord, O my soul. 
all my inmost being, that's the heart, praise His holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. What benefits? What are we to be thankful for? Who forgives all your sins. That's the first one. And heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit. Who crowns you with love and compassion. Who satisfies your desires with good things. There is material blessing. So that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The psalm writers are telling us that God is worthy of our worship. Worthy of our extravagant devotion. And our worship must begin with the giving of thanks. Secondly, we see in this psalm that giving thanks is also obedience. Giving thanks is worship. It's also obedience. Many of you know, especially you guys who go to team, uh, know that I've developed a strange affection for a family of bearded men in Louisiana. Uh, the Robertson family, the stars of the TV show Duck Dynasty, uh, which has become nothing less than a cultural phenomenon. Did you know that the first episode of the current series was watched by over 11 million viewers, making it the most watched nonfiction show in cable television history? Remarkable. A bunch of self-proclaimed rednecks who make duck calls for a living. But what makes the show more interesting to me is that every single show ends in prayer. At the end of every single episode, the family gathers around a big table, and the patriarch, Phil Robertson, offers a prayer of thanksgiving. And here's one of his recent prayers. Father, we thank you for this, this good food that you've blessed us with. Help us to love you more and to love each other. Amen. Sometimes he prays in Jesus' name. Now, as you read about the history of the show, early on, the producers tried to get Phil to drop the praying part. They were uncomfortable with the praying part, especially when he prays in Jesus' name. But he refused and has refused all the way to this point to drop the prayer from the show because he believes it would be denying his faith and dishonoring God to do so. In other words, Phil Robertson believes that giving thanks is non-negotiable. So why do we, those of us who do, pray before meals or say grace before we share a meal together? Well, the Christian practice of praying before meals comes down to us from an ancient Jewish tradition that was anchored in the connection between the offering of sacrifices and the communal feast that often followed. Jesus himself prayed several times before sharing meals with those he was with. Before the, in the feeding of the 5,000, uh, when he met with the disciples at the Last Supper, when he uh, met with the two uh, on the road to Emmaus, it says Jesus took bread, blessed it, and gave thanks, and then they shared meals together. In Acts 27, the apostle Paul is lost at sea with over 200 other people. We're told that he encourages them to take food. But before he does so, it says he took bread and gave thanks to God before all of them. So, while we're not expressly commanded to pray a prayer before we eat, we, we have all kinds of precedent for doing so. But when it comes to worship, we are actually commanded over and over again to give thanks. More than that, failure to offer thanksgiving to God is identified in the New Testament as a form of sin. Let me read for you Romans chapter 1, verse 21. Paul is writing. He says, For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Now, if you know the context of Romans chapter 1 and chapter 2, Paul here is introducing the fundamental problem of all humanity, the spiritual disease called sin that not only infects every single human heart, but has distorted all of the created order. And so we can expect him to talk about darkened hearts. We expect him to talk about idolatry and all manner of immoral behavior, evil, murder, covetousness, covetousness malice, envy, deceit, which he does in chapter 1 of Romans. We expect him to say things like, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, which he does in Romans chapter 3. We expect him to say the wages of sin is death, which he does in Romans chapter 6. What we don't expect is for him to identify the lack of thanksgiving of all things to be part of all that. Have you ever thought of unthankfulness as sin? Listen to 19th century preacher and theologian Charles Spurgeon who wrote, Did you know, dear friends, that unthankfulness was such a sin as this? Have you ever thought of it in this light before, that men were without excuse because when they knew God, they were not thankful? 
Unthankfulness is a sin for which there is no excuse if it be attended with knowledge. I fear there are thousands who call themselves Christians who are not thankful, and yet they never thought themselves guilty on that account. I tremble both for myself and you when I see want of thankfulness thus set in the front rank of sins. Why? I mean, we can see why murder and stealing and idolatry would be called sin. But unthankfulness? Why? Well, first, because when we fail to give thanks, we dishonor God by taking all He has done and all He has made for granted. We become like The spoiled child who sits down at the table filled with his favorite foods and eats his fill in the leaves without ever thinking to give thanks to his mother who spent hours preparing it. Or like the husband who does likewise. In the animated TV show The Simpsons, the son Bart is given his chance to say grace. He says, dear God, we paid for this stuff ourselves, so thanks for nothing. We become like Bart Simpson. Notice in this psalm how the writer refuses to take for granted what God has done. He says, great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. I'll talk more about that later. Full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered, for the Lord is gracious and merciful. Second, we often fail to give thanks because we focus on what we do not have. Nicer car, nicer home, enough money to take a vacation to Tahiti for all of February, maybe for a whole year. A couple weeks ago, I ran into someone every day for a whole week who was just getting ready to go on vacation to somewhere warm. Every place I turned, hey, we're going to Mexico next week. Hey, we're going to Florida next week. Hey, we're going to Arizona next week. I could feel that inside me. (laughs) Oh, yeah? I'm staying in Illinois in the polar vortex, right? When we focus on what we do not have, we behave as if if what God has already given us is not enough, as if somehow we deserve more or He owes us something. That's what's happening when I allow the weather to rob me of gratitude or when I struggle to be happy for someone else's success. A third reason is we sometimes fail to express gratitude when we allow our troubles or even our pain to obscure God's blessing and presence. Now, this is a hard one. Hardly a week goes by when we as ministry staff don't hear about multiple individuals or families going through some painful or extremely difficult part of their journey. We hear about those. You turn in those prayer requests. We pray every week. We ask for God's deliverance, His care, His healing. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians about these times. Be joyful always. Pray continually. And then this. Give thanks in all circumstances For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Remember, Paul is a man who knew something about suffering. He knew something about persecution. And he's writing to people, the earliest followers of Christ, who are also being abused and ridiculed for their faith in Christ. Yet he says, give thanks in all circumstances. What's he mean? How do you do that? I think what he means is remember that God is in every circumstance of our lives. If he's sovereign, he's sovereign over even that circumstance in your life. He can work in and through every circumstance of your life. Perhaps healing, perhaps deliverance, perhaps perseverance and maturity, perhaps for his own glory. But there's something you can find to be grateful for. I mentioned a month and a half ago or so, a friend of mine named Tom Randall, dear friend of my brother's, now is a pastor on the staff at his church in Ohio, uh, was arrested in the Philippine Islands on false charges, spent three weeks in a dangerous Filipino prison cell, not knowing if he'd ever be released or where he might die in that cell. But every day, Tom expressed gratitude for the opportunity to share the gospel with men he might never see otherwise than in prison. Gratitude. So we're going to find ways to express thanksgiving, perhaps not for our circumstances, but certainly in our circumstances. Three ways we can give thanks. First, we are to express thanksgiving with our hearts. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart, he says. This is the personal, spiritual dimension of thanksgiving. What happens inside of you as you pray, as you think about God? Secondly, we can express thanksgiving with our lips. In the company of the upright in the congregation, this is the public dimension of our thanksgiving. What we do when we gather here 
in corporate worship. Thirdly, we can express thanksgiving through our means, with our wealth. Back to Leviticus for a moment. People were to bring to God their sacrifices of thanksgiving, that is a portion of their wealth, their grain, their livestock, to offer to God as a tangible expression of thanksgiving. That's why we have our offering time in the middle of worship. Not before, not after, not private, but in the middle, publicly. Because our generosity is an expression of our thanksgiving. And when we withhold our means, when we withhold our wealth, we fail to offer God thanksgiving that he is due. Thanksgiving is worship. Thanksgiving is obedience. And thirdly, giving thanks is to be a way of life. Now, I struggled with how to say this in the outline. Let me try to explain. Giving thanks is to be a way of life. Several years ago, I was on an airplane flight somewhere. I don't fly that often, but I was on my way somewhere. I don't remember where I was going or what I was doing. But I remember coming back, uh, the, it was just a rough flight. The weather was bad. And I don't have a fear of flying. I have a fear of landing. I, I just, it makes me nervous as the plane comes down. I'm taking off, it's fine, I'm coming down, I start getting nervous because you can feel the speed of the plane. In this case, it started to shake and rattle. All the stewardesses or flight attendants sat down, which is strapped themselves in, which makes me nervous. So they're all doing that, it's shaking, the wings are going back and forth like that. And we finally, after like, it seemed like an eternity, hit the runway and bounced like three times. You could feel it, bang, 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 and finally came to a stop. When we stopped, everyone erupted with spontaneous uh, applause and cheering. You don't see that every day on a plane. As we're filing off, uh, as I got toward the front, the cockpit door opened. I don't think they do, they do this anymore. And the pilot himself stepped out. You know, he had the hat, the wings, and everything. He was standing right there at the front. And usually, I would just walk off and get to my next thing, right? That's what everybody does. You just get off. But I was kind of, just felt spontaneously like thanking the guy. Because I was relieved, you know, my landing fear had been, we, we landed. So we, I got to the front. I looked at him right in the eye, and I said, that was a good landing. Thank you for getting us down. He looked at me kind of surprised, and he said, thank you. But I could see on his face, just briefly, two things. I could see, first of all, that he had been worried, too, that it was a good landing. And secondly, I could see that maybe it had been a long time since anyone had thanked him for doing a good job. You see, I think we live in what might be called a thankless culture. We live in a culture of rights. and We know our rights. We demand our rights. We live in a land of service. We pay for it, and we expect it. The result is we do not live in a culture of gratitude. We live in a culture of discontent and complaining. Isn't that true? But listen to what Paul says about how we, of all people, are to live. Ephesians chapter 5. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Always giving thanks. Thanks. I found a little piece on a blog on the internet. I don't know if this was a pastor. I didn't write down the person's name, but someone wrote this. I thought it was good. To live rightly in the presence and communion of God is to live in a state of constant thanksgiving. For from him we receive all that we have, our life and existence, all good things, the hope of redemption and the joy of communion. The offering of thanksgiving is the acknowledgement within our heart that we ourselves are not the author of any of these things, but rather the recipients, those who receive gifts from God. That's good. Back to the psalm. Several keys to being continuously thankful. He writes, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Beautiful phrase. Look at the works of the Lord. I think he's talking there about what God has done, what he has created, the splendor and majesty of all God has made. And as you look at our FECG Facebook page and what people have posted there, there are images taken by cell phones of sunrises. Some people are up really early. Sunsets, even beautiful formations of snow and ice, finding reasons to thank God for his beauty, even in the polar vortex. You see, the more we study his works, the more we take delight in them. The more we study his works, the more we take delight in him. Next, he says, he provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. Food. He provides food. Scripture connects his provision of food with the way he remembers his covenant promise to us. 
I don't know about you, but I eat at least three times a day. Sometimes more than that. And every time I take food to my lips, the psalm writer says, that's an opportunity to remember the God who remembers his covenant forever and offer thanksgiving. I don't know if you're not in the habit of doing that or not. If you're not in the habit of offering a prayer of thanksgiving before you eat, either as a family, as a couple, by yourself, at work, might be a good time to start that habit. Allow food to remind you to give thanks. And then this, he's shown his people the power of his works, giving them the inheritance of the nations. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Three phrases, the inheritance of the nations, his redemption, and his covenant all refer to the great promise of salvation. They refer to the hope of the gospel itself. And this is the deepest, the most fundamental level of our thanksgiving. Even when we struggle to see anything good in our circumstances, even when we struggle with the cold and the ice and the polar vortex, even when other people are going to Mexico and, 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 and Palm Springs for vacation, even when the wheels are falling off of our lives, his promise of salvation holds true firm. And therefore, we can always express gratitude. We've been trying to offer challenges to, uh, for you and to ourselves to grow as worshipers. And here's a challenge I wanted to give you this week. I would like you to read Psalm 111, first nine verses, every day this week. Psalm 111 is easy to remember. It's three ones. 111. Read all nine verses. There's a tenth verse you can read, but it's not connected to the other nine. But read them every day. Read slowly. Read them in the morning. Read them at night. Read them before you go to bed. Read them at lunch. It only takes about 30 seconds. Read the psalm. And each time you see a word or a phrase that sparks the thought, that sparks a desire to give thanks, then stop and do that. Write it down. Post it. Tweet it. Something. Or just better yet, offer it as a prayer of your own heart. Grow as a worshiper. Grow in thanksgiving. Secondly, Look for opportunities to express thanks to other people. To other people. You know, we have such a tendency, and I have such a tendency, to be critical in my spirit of other people. Slow service. You could do better. You're not paid for that. Look for chances to thank people for what they've done, maybe just for who they are. And thirdly, ask God what you can give back to Him as an expression, a tangible expression of thanksgiving your time, your talent in service, maybe your treasure, your resources, just to say thank you. Ask him to grow your heart in gratitude. Let's bow in prayer as we close. Lord God, we thank you today for your word. We thank you for your works that are all around us and that we take for granted so often. We thank you for the great gift and hope of your salvation. Teach us to be people marked not by criticism, not by complaining, not by insisting on our rights, but a people marked by our gratitude. Grow us as worshipers. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.